Hello, and thank you for joining us for the first in this fall speaker series. Tonight, we're excited to have with us Lydia X.C. Brown. Lydia X.C. Brown is a disability justice advocate, organizer, and writer whose work focuses on the violence perpetrated against multiply, multiply marginalized disabled people, especially through institutionalization, incarceration, and policing practices. Currently, they are a Justice Catalyst Fellow at the, at the Basilon Center for Mental Health Law. In that role, they defend and advance the educational and civil rights of Maryland students with psychosocial, intellectual, and developmental disabilities facing disproportionate discipline, restraint, and seclusion, and school push-out. They are a founder and co-director of the Fund for Community Reparations for Artistic People of Color's Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment, which provides direct support and mutual aid to individual autistic people of color. Lydia is also an editor and contributor for the book, All the Way of Our Dreams, on Living Racialized Autism. One small anecdote exemplifies Lydia's drive for equity. While atten attending Georgetown University, they served as the first undersecretary for disability affairs for the Georgetown University Student Association. After graduating, an entire team of people were required to take over the work that Lydia had been solely responsible for in that position. The full record of Lydia's work and accolades is too long to fully enumerate. Suffice to say that their efforts in addressing ableism is inspiring. Their work is intersectional. They advocate for disabled people who are black and brown, gay, straight, and bi, genderqueer, and trans, and more. Lydia has a holistic approach to disability that accounts for natural human diversity. Tonight, Lydia will pre be presenting on how disabled people's cultural work, community building, and leadership offer necessary interventions for liberation work everywhere from the streets to the ivory tower, grounded in intersectional theory and practice. Uh, please welcome the Axie Brown. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to get here to Vermont, even though it involved driving for a couple of hours through roads where my GPS stopped working <coughs> and debating whether or not I would have to pull over and ask someone, so um, have you heard of this town called Putney? How do you get there? Can you help me get there? Because I'm supposed to be there at a certain time and I don't know where I am. I did not have to do that. I made it here and I even walked up the damn hill. I'm not sure why I agreed to that. We thought about driving, but then I thought that's really short. Maybe I, I should just walk it. And then I promptly regretted that decision. So thank you for welcoming me to your campus and to your hill, which is less happy. I begin every facilitation and presentation the same way, and that is with an invitation and an invocation. My invitation is for us to use this space in whatever way our body minds need and prefer. The image that is on the screen behind me shows people in silhouettes of various body shapes and sizes, some with mobility equipment, others not. Many of them are sitting or lying or moving in ways that would often be considered <coughs> unprofessional or inappropriate. My personal favorite is the one right here who is lying flat on their back on the ground. That person speaks to my soul. <laughs> I am. <coughs> and this being the third time that I've spoken with people today and yesterday, having given three talks as well, that person will be me in about two hours from now, <laughs> quite literally. Now, my favorite is when I've been asked to facilitate for a, a whole day or a whole weekend one time, and I establish very strict boundaries for my time. I tell people, at lunchtime, do not speak to me. Do not find me. I will be under a table hiding. Only come speak to me if the building is actually on fire, in which case you have permission to use physical force to remove me. <laughs> so I relate very much. I want us to use the space in the ways that our body minds need in order to occupy it, to take up space, to move in the way that makes sense for what we need to feel comfortable, to belong, to expand, to take up space in the way that bodies are meant to do with the atoms and molecules that comprise our existence. There are some extra seats in this space. Feel free to use those for yourself or your belongings. If you prefer to sit or lie on the floor or move about the space, you are welcome to do that. I simply ask that you keep the exit ways clear so that if this building catches fire, we are in fact able to escape instead of dying. <coughs> that would be highly unpleasant. And for those who are observing a terrible way to start the new year, that is not how I would plan on doing it. So keep the doorways clear, but feel free to use the rest of the space as you like. There's some front space, there's some back space. We've only been asked by Brattleboro Community News to keep these two rows preferably clear of heads. Your head might be okay. But generally, we've been asked to keep these two rows clear of 
human heads. Apparently, people want to see me, so I guess you can't see me if there are heads right there. I don't really know. That's just what I was told. My invocation is for each of us to take a moment of grounding, of pause, to tune in to what our body minds are telling us, what it is that they need for us to understand, to know, to hear, what it is, in fact, that they desire, they crave, they need. Whether it is that you have brought into this space hunger or thirst or exhaustion, you've brought into this space eager anticipation, enthusiasm, excitement, you are joyful, or perhaps instead you are wracked with anxiety. You are exhausted, bone weary. You have come to this space and you are in mourning or grief. You carry with you your anger, your frustration, your righteous rage. Whatever it is that we have brought into this space, I ask and invite us now to give ourselves permission to feel what it is that we are feeling so that we can meet ourselves where we are at. Too often when we enter into spaces like this one, academic or professional spaces, we are expected and we impose the expectation on ourselves that we are to leave to check our body mind at the door, that we are not to bring into this space what it is that we feel, what it is that we carry, that if we do so, we are somehow deemed automatically disruptive, unprofessional, inappropriate. And for those of us who've been marginalized or at the margins of the margins, that we will be punished for what we carry with us. So I want us to take that moment together. Sometimes people like to close their eyes for this. You don't have to do that if you don't want. Personally, I feel awkward about it, but you are welcome to do as you please. And we're going to take that moment of pausing and grounding together now. Thank you. I begin every facilitation in the same way because I do my work grounded in a practice of disability justice, this term that you've seen on all the weirdly awkward flyers around campus. And disability justice for me has always begun as an art and practice of honoring and affirming the body mind our own body minds, the body minds of others around us, the body minds of those with whom we work alongside, we live alongside, we struggle alongside, those in our communities and our shared spaces, to honor and affirm that all of our body minds are in fact worthy, that we belong, that we deserve to exist and to quite literally take up space. And so my request for us to make space for our body minds to feel what it is that they are feeling is a request for us to begin in some small way to practice a little bit of what disability justice feels like, to honor and affirm that our body minds deserve to be here, deserve to be present, deserve to take up space, that there is in fact no wrong way to have a body mind. The second note that I want to leave us with as we move into the meat of our time together is a note that I will be discussing at some point some issues of violence and abuse. I do not plan to provide any graphic descriptions or graphic discussion of abuse, but I want you all to know that there will be some mention of these topics during our time tonight. And if at any time you feel the need to take a break, to recollect or reground yourself, or you find that you no longer have the capacity to participate or to engage, then you are welcome to withdraw from this space. And I will not assume that that means you hate me or think I'm terrible. Well, okay, I have social anxiety. So the social anxiety part of my brain will assume that you hate me and that you think I'm a terrible speaker and that I should have never come here. But that social anxiety part of my brain is already telling me that all of you individually and separately already personally hate me and want me to die. But we can all tell my social anxiety that it is wrong and it should shut up and sit in the corner and think about what it's done. <laughs> the image that is on this slide is of a silhouette of a person in a ponytail speaking into a bullhorn, and it notes the content warning that I will be speaking about some topics of violence. So I said that I'm here tonight to talk to you about what disability justice is and how disability justice is an imperative for the neurodiversity movement, and therefore, for each and every one of us in our lives, as community members, as students, as scholars, as staff, as people who are present in this shared community, in this town with too many hills. <laughs> I'm not a fan of hills. 
I am quite physically lazy. I am not physically fit. I probably never will be physically fit, and physical fitness and I belong together, much like ISIS and religious tolerance. <laughs> Don't leave me in a gym. <laughs> it's dangerous for the other people in the gym. <laughs> so when we talk about disability justice, we are talking about the stories that we tell about ourselves and about each other. We are talking about how we understand our own lives and the lives of others around us and what it is that we believe it is our duty or it is our obligation to do in response to the social issues and problems that we encounter in our own lives and throughout society and over the course of our time shared journeying on this earth. And one of the things that often comes to mind for me when we talk about disability justice is that we always need to dial that back a bit and think, well, what is the disability part of this conversation, the disability part of disability justice? Because if you ask a room of about 20 people, what is in fact disability? We're probably going to get at least 20 different answers. We're going to define it in a different way. We're going to understand it or conceptualize it in a different way. We're all bringing to the table narratives and stories and frameworks for understanding and naming what that even is. And for us to grapple with what disability justice might be also requires us to grapple with where we start when we begin to think about disability. From the moment that we are born and enter into society, we are offered many narratives for understanding what disability might be. And let's talk about what some of those are and how they connect to the, our lives in marginalized communities across and within disability and outside of it. One of the most common models or stories for talking about disability is that of inspiration. That's the top left-hand corner of this slide. And when we talk about disability from an inspirational narrative, what we say is that the only acceptable ways to discuss disability, whatever that might be, and whatever it might encapsulate, is to describe it as something that is heartwarming or tear-jerking, something that makes you, the you, presumptively a non-disabled person, feel good or better about yourself. In other words, the inspiration stories about disability are the kind that we're familiar with that say, well, this person was a double amputee and accomplished winning some marathon, so what's your excuse now? This person was blind and clowned Mount Everest. What is your excuse now? And for the record, I don't know if anyone here does mountain climbing. Anyone? A few people, a few tentative hands, yeah. So you all know that Mount Everest not only is the tallest peak in the world to summit, but of those who attempt to do so, several of them become frozen corpses every year. There are a lot of frozen corpses on the side of that mountain and out in the Himalayas. And so when we talk about someone having successfully climbed Mount Everest, it's really not so much the fact that this person may have been blind or had some other disability that made that extraordinary and therefore inspiring, but the fact that they didn't become one of the frozen corpses, <laughs> that part. They're, they're not a frozen corpse, therefore this is quite inspiring for them to have achieved that. But this inspiration narrative also cuts into stories about the mundane, that somehow if someone with Down syndrome has once participated in a sport, that is inspiring. That somehow a person in a wheelchair has gone grocery shopping, that this is brave and heroic. Or worst of all, when the story is explicitly about a non-disabled person, and it will say, you know, fifth grade boy, such a hero of the entire class because he didn't call his classmate with autism the R slur. He once invited his classmate with autism to sit at the table with him. He once invited, once he hit 11th grade, the girl with Down syndrome to prom to give her a special night out. The implication being, of course, that not only is this a pity date because, of course, she couldn't get a real date, someone to actually be interested in her, but even more insidiously, she would never know or find out that she had simply been pitied and taken for a pity ride so that this person, this non-disabled person, could wear it as a heroic cape. The inspiration stories of disability are very similar to stories that we talk about in the context of class and race and gender that say that it's somehow particularly inspirational if someone started as homeless or migrated to the U.S. with $40 in their pocket and now they are a multimillionaire. Now they are the owner of a multinational company. Now they have graduated from Yale Law School and that accomplishment is somehow what means they are worthy of personhood. The inspiration narrative of disability tells us that if we are disabled, our personhood can can only be attained through what we offer to non-disabled people and making them feel better about themselves. As a reminder, in its starkest form, that at least no matter how bad they might have it, they are not like us. The other side of that coin 
is this charity narrative of disability that tells us that we as disabled people ought to be pitied and tragic because our lives are necessarily those of suffering, that everything about our existence is something negative and bad and detrimental, that the only possible way to respond to us as disabled people in society is to respond to us with offers to help from those who are always presumptively non-disabled to begin with, is to say that we need someone to dang to give money to some organization over there that will maybe do something to support us or maybe hold the door open once in a while to see your five gold stars, and in other words, use us as the yardstick for the morality of non-disabled people. In other words, this narrative about disability and what it means and how it should be responded to or conceptualized in society is that disability exists for the edification of non-disabled people, is that disability, in fact, creates opportunities for able saviorism. An eerie parallel to how we talk about, for example, rich young white college grads traveling to Africa, which is definitely a country, to save poor black children because clearly if you live in the global south and you are black or brown, you need the help of some white people to save or rescue you from yourself because nobody where you are from could possibly have decided this is what we need and will fight for and create in our own community. You see, oppression is not interchangeable. Oppressions are not identical but they do operate in certain patterns of how they target and marginalize the communities who are affected by them. And some of those patterns cut across the narratives that we tell. Their specific manifestations may be particular to specific identities or experiences or communities or histories, but the shape that those narratives take often fall into certain identifiable and recognizable patterns. The third narrative that we often encounter in society on disability is one of moralizing. The narrative that tells us that you are disabled, you experience a challenge because you didn't try hard enough, because you didn't have a good enough attitude, because we all know that if we smile enough at a set of stairs, they magically become a ramp, sorcery. We also know that if you're hearing voices and the voices you are hearing are causing you distress, that you can just try to not be schizophrenic. And if you try hard enough and put enough good energy out into the world, then perhaps you would become not schizophrenic, magically. The moralizing narrative tells us that disability is something inherently negative and therefore we must blame someone or something for it because it is a problem. And what we ought to blame or whom we ought to blame will be the disabled person ourself or sometimes our parents or our ancestors, that their wrongs or their iniquities or their failures or irresponsibilities have led to the punishment or karmic justice of the creation of disability, or in the political policies of our day and across the world, the policies of austerity or of bootstrap theory, that it is in fact our own fault because we were not sufficiently productive or contributing members of society, because we did not pull our own weight, because we are burdensome to our families, our neighbors, our entire community, because we are too much too intense, to everything. The fourth narrative that we often catch about disability is that of medicalizing. To say that disability must be your private and individual personal health problem. And that if disability is your private and individual personal health problem, then it is your responsibility, it is incumbent upon you to seek medical or psychiatric treatment for the purposes of rehabilitation, for the purposes of cure, for the purposes of, in its grandest design, elimination and prevention of disability as necessarily detrimental and deleterious to the human condition. And all of these narratives that we tell about disability and their similar parallel narratives that we tell about other marginalized and targeted communities share in common that they are hyper-individualizing. And what I mean by that is that they deliberately render invisible the ways in which societal values and structures and interpersonal networks of relations have created oppressive and harmful conditions so that we can place the onus of remediating those conditions, conditions onto the people who are themselves oppressed rather than ending the oppression in society. 
That is what it means to hyper-individualize oppression. It is a means of distraction. It is a means of blame shifting. It is a means itself of perpetuating the very same oppression that engenders it. In response to these harmful and often dangerous narratives about disability, many of which elide clear boundaries and blur into one another, cannot necessarily be separated into silos. Disabled activists for many decades have instead pushed alternate frameworks and narratives for talking about what disability is and how we ought to therefore respond to it and situate it in society. And one of the most powerful of those is the social model of disability. That's the bottom left hand now. The social model of disability, this, uh, this narrative of what disability means, tells us that rather than being a problem located in the brain or the body of the disabled person, that disability is actually located and created within societal and cultural values. That is, that disability is a social construct. It is fictive. It is created, for example, by the fact that not most of us are not fluent in both a spoken and written language and a manual or signed language, but if we were, then to be deaf would not be disabling because we would each have equal communication access. <coughs> it is the fact that the room that we are in now, the primary way to access most of this space is through stairs. And that is the fact for most buildings and for most homes and public buildings in the world that we live in now, that we assume that all bodies are able to navigate different levels of access without any level means of access between them. But if we instead radically reconceptualized how we made architecture happen, then to be a person with a wheelchair or a scooter would no longer be disabling. Disability does not exist in nature, only in society. But the failure or the limitation of the social model of disability is that in the end, despite all of its power and possibility, it ultimately fails to capture the lived experiences of actually disabled people. For those of us who are in fact chronically ill or neurodivergent or mad or disabled or all of these things combined, we know that if we have chronic fatigue or chronic pain or seizures or sensory overstimulation or intrusive thoughts that no amount of accommodations would somehow make those disappear. That even if the world were maximally flexible, maximally understanding, maximally supportive, maximally accessible, universally designed, always willing to not just accommodate but center access, that at the end of the day, sometimes our bodies would still hurt. Sometimes we would still be fatigued. Sometimes we would still have the seizure or the flare up or the episode of intense intrusive thoughts. Perhaps those experiences with the anxiety or the pain would be less frequent or less severe in nature because we, be, we would be subjected to infinitely less stressors and triggers than we are in this inaccessible and violent world but at the end of the day, they would still be there sometimes. And so what many of us have sought to do instead to not merely reject the harmful and dehumanizing modalities, these narratives of disability that other us, that exclude us, that treat us as objects and never as the narrators of our own stories, but also attempt to harness the power of the social model without falling into its pitfall is that we've instead looked to what I've called collectively a set of diversity models for understanding disability. And I want to be very clear that when I say diversity, I do not mean a college brochure that says on pages one through 17, a lot of pictures of smiling white faces and some vaguely blurred images of vaguely more melanated people in the background. And, um, and on pages 17, um, 17 through 19 on the spread that is labeled diversity and inclusion on those pages there are some smiling images of a couple of black students and East Asian students maybe a vaguely brown person wearing a hijab or a turban a conventionally attractive white woman in a wheelchair if you're lucky and perhaps a conventionally attractive white but flamboyantly gay man and all those people in those pictures were at last at this school about 15 to 20 years ago, but we're still using their pictures now because diversity and inclusion really matters at our campus with 9% students of color. That's not the kind of diversity that I mean when I talk about a diversity approach to disability. What I mean by this is recognizing the reality that all of us as human beings are in fact 
different people, that there are infinite possible configurations of our body minds, that our body minds move and sense and learn and communicate receptively and expressively in a myriad of ways, that our body minds have infinite possible configurations for how we form relationships for our sexualities and our asexualities, for our genders, for what cultures we come from, for what race we are, for what ethnicities we can claim, for what faiths we profess, for where we build our homes and how we create them. That we have infinitely diverse possibilities for how we move through the world and craft our own lives. And that because of that, our experiences as disabled, as neurodivergent, as ill, as mad, are in fact part of the fabric of human diversity. They are part and parcel with what it means to be human. As Gregor Mendel said, we are part of those endless forms most beautiful. But to understand why we must grapple with such harmful and dehumanizing messages about what disability is and how we are to continue existing in a world that thinks we ought not to, we must name the oppression that we face. We must name what ableism is. Ableism is, at its core, a form of structural oppression. And what that means is that it is a system of power relations wherein those people whose body minds are construed as healthy, as functional, as whole, as sane, as valuable, as worthy, as desirable, as ideal, as aspirational, those people are granted and endowed with certain types of political, social, and economic power at the direct expense of those whose body minds are configured instead as disordered, deficient, lacking, defective, sick, broken, unhealthy, deviant, disruptive, unruly, or ungovernable. Ableism is a form of oppression that targets those who either are deemed disabled, who are defined as such under legal or medical or psychiatric definitions, who merely have disability imputed onto them regardless of personal identification, or who have the characteristics of disability assigned to them as a means of political subjugation by membership in another targeted or minoritized group of people. Ableism is a way of thinking and doing, in other words, that harms disabled people. It is the process by which we continue to exist in a society that tells us that only some of us are worthy to exist, to be here, to reproduce, and to be reproduced, and that others among us do not deserve to exist, to be present, to reproduce, or to be reproduced. That only some of us can lay claim to personhood and that the rest of us have personhood that is only contingent or conditional, miniaturized, or existing solely for the purpose that our energy and our resources may be exploited and extracted from for the benefit of those who already possess the most power and privilege and resources. Ableism as a system is inherently capitalist in how we live it now because it is embedded with notions of our worth as tied to our productivity, as tied to what we produce, in what manner we produce it, how quickly we produce it, and for whose benefit and to whose detriment it will be produced. It is, in other words, tied in with notions that we are worthy by proving or demonstrating our worth by what and how we contribute. That if we can say we are a contributing member of society, suddenly we have established value. And that contribution is measured in capital, in gain, and contribution to the global wealth accumulation project. Ableism is an inherently white supremacist and racist system. In this country, in this illegitimate nation in which we stand and sit and lie now, a nation that was built 
upon not merely stolen land, but genocide of native peoples and entire nations and communities, a nation which invented an entire system of law to retroactively justify and fictionalize the concept of title to a plot of land, something intangible and immeasurable, a country that built its wealth upon chattel enslavement of kidnapped black Africans and their descendants, a country that has built itself upon naming whiteness as superior, as ideal, as the thing to which we all ought to aspire, ableism is inherently racist. The notion that the white body mind is necessarily superior to that of black, brown, native, Latinx, or Asian people's body minds is one that is embedded within ableist logic. In particular, in this country, it is important and necessary for us to name that ableism is particularly and virulently anti-black in its nature. And I name that very particularly from my positionality as an East Asian person of color, that we must name that ableism has always been anti-black in this country. It not only juxtaposes ableness with whiteness, but it juxtaposes debility and precarity and inferiority with blackness. That is how ableism and white supremacy have always operated in tandem here. Ableism is necessarily at its core eugenicist. What that means is that ableism is preoccupied not merely with notions of who ought to reproduce and who ought to be reproduced, but with which humans are the best ones, the most worthwhile to continue to exist. You see, the age of eugenic science had its heyday in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich in the Nazi regime, they drew their inspiration for their genocide <coughs> from the United States from the fact that eugenics was not merely considered mainstream and widely accepted, but in fact, innovative science, to the point where we had societies for public hygiene, that is, to cleanse society of the undesirables throughout this country, we exported eugenics to the Nazi regime. We exported it. Ableism is always preoccupied with who can be prevented from reproducing a kind like them a kind like us. We can understand ableism, therefore, as encompassing many aspects that make it oppression. You might call it prejudice or bias or bigotry. Those are the words that ring the circle in the middle here. You might call it prejudice. You might call it hate. It is all of those things. But ableism is not merely hate of disabled people or of disabledness, but ableism is also pity and fear and shame and revulsion. Ableism teaches us to be ashamed and afraid of our own body minds, of their incapacities, their limitations, their frailties, their precarities, their debilities. Ableism teaches us to fear becoming disabled or becoming more disabled. Ableism teaches us that if we may lay claim to our worth through notions of intelligence or strength or wholeness, physical capability, then to lose those things, to have less of them than someone sitting next to us, somehow must necessarily diminish our personhood. Ableism teaches us to fear our end, that as we approach our deaths, we might become or take on the quality of disability, even if we were not born with it. And yet, from the moment that each of us is born, we have already begun the process of dying. From the moment that each of us is born, our bodies have already begun to break down, to slow, to crumble to change, and throughout our lifespans, journeying from one point to another, our body minds and their capacities and limitations are constantly in flux. They are fluid. They shift from period to period, from month to month, from moment to moment. Ableism teaches us to fear those fluctuations, to dread what changes may come to our capacities, but ableism is dangerously violent and wrong. You see, ableism is not merely also some set of vaguely abstract ideas, but ableism is policies and practices and relations that enact and perpetuate violence on those it targets. 
Ableism is the fact that according to Section 14C of the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act, it is completely legally permissible to pay disabled people sub-minimum wage, cents <coughs> per hour for menial labor. The idea of some minimum is something that should not even exist because minimum is supposed to mean floor. There is nothing beneath it. Here is the minimum. You cannot go any farther than this. And yet, sub-minimum wage is a concept that exists in our legal and political vocabulary. And when we understand how ableism is necessarily connected to, dependent on, and necessary for other oppressions, we recognize whose labor it is that our political economy literally, quantifiably devalues. Because the same law creates certain classifications of workers, those who are working in low wage, poor conditions, such as tipped workers, to be able to be paid a few dollars per hour as the minimum wage under the expectation that customers' tips are supposed to subsidize the business's profits. That those who are incarcerated will be required to work for cents or perhaps dollars if they are lucky on the hour for free, a few dollars. And in a few states are required to work without any remuneration whatsoever. And if they refuse work, if they refuse to go on to work detail, you, as an incarcerated person, will be subjected to punishment, including solitary confinement or the writing of disciplinary tickets that will reflect poorly on your chances at parole or earning good time with the possibility of ever leaving prison. We literally and quantifiably devalue the labor of certain classes of human beings in this nation that allegedly prides itself upon egalitarianism and meritocracy, lies. Ableism is the fact that in 1927, our Supreme Court ruled in the landmark case of Buck v. Bell that forcible sterilization could take place for the benefit of society. You see, the case was brought centering around a white woman with disabilities whose name was Carrie Buck whose mother and infant child were labeled as having disabilities as well. The child who was born as the result of sexual assault while working as an indentured servant. Because they were labeled as having intellectual disabilities and the specific diagnostic term of the era that was used was imbecile, the case was brought as a test to the Supreme Court in an attempt to institutionalize and engender support for the, per for the, for the process of forcible sterilization for eugenic purposes across the country. And so in a decision in favor of the sterilization occurring, the court found that not only was the sterilization not a violation of Carrie Buck's rights, but in fact, this decision was in the public interest. It was for the greater good. And as the acting Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, the supposedly lauded progressive jurist, I quote him, three generations of imbeciles are enough. After the Buck v. Bell decision, in 1927, eugenic sterilization campaigns went into full force across this country, leading to over 70,000 documented sterilizations that took place. Over 30,000 of those took place in California between 1929 and 1979, largely on Latinx and mostly Chicanx women, most of whom were labeled as candidates for sterilization because of promiscuity, criminality, and disability, categories which were intended to be interchangeable and alighting clear boundaries. The majority of those targeted for eugenic sterilization in the mainland and in the colonies the U.S holds because yes, we hold colonies like that in Puerto Rico have, really, have largely targeted women who are Latinx or black or indigenous, most of whom were labeled with the specter of disability as the means and the requirement necessary to enable their sterilization. Ableism is the fact that today, less than a couple hours away from where we are now at an institution in Massachusetts just outside of Boston, disabled people are subjected to painful electric shock as a form of torture. They call it behavioral modification. They call it treatment. This facility has been in operation since 1971. They began using the shocks in 1988, using a device that the founder invented to be deliberately more powerful and painful than a police taser. Six people have died in the care of this facility since its opening. And yet, despite having been condemned twice by the United Nations, it remains legal and in fact legally signed off on by a judge every time it occurs. Ableism is the reality that if you call it treatment, you can do it to somebody who is disabled. Ableism is the fact that as the organization heard helping educate to advance the rights of deaf communities estimates that 80% 
of those who are killed by police and 80% of those who are incarcerated are disabled. That means that if you are black or native and you are disabled, that you hold the highest possible chance to be targeted for state violence, for state execution, for being locked inside of a cage. Talila Lewis tells us that race and disability is the most dangerous intersection that history has ever created. When we talk about ableism, we are talking about the intricate and everyday violences that we face. We are talking about the fact that for so many of us, we are caught between the rock and the hard place of being told that to assert our humanity means to assert that we are not like them, that we don't belong to that category, don't let me in with those people over there. And yet that in itself is a form of violence that we do not only to others, but most harmfully and most dangerously to ourselves. I call this disavowal, and we all learn to do it from the time that we're very young. The image that's on the screen here shows silhouettes of people who are all standing and note that they are all thin. They are holding signs, it's not important what they say, protesting in some way. But a member of their group is saying, no, not you, to a person who is sitting on the ground who is panhandling from a cup. And the idea behind this image, which by the way, I, was, I had a lot of fun creating this. The idea behind this image is that the people who are protesting to demand some measure, some semblance of rights or equality or justice, are doing so by saying, we deserve this, but not you not you over there. You stay away from us, you are inconvenient, you are burdensome, please keep away. We want this, but not you. And really what this is, is an investment in scarcity. The idea that there's only so many rights, so much equality or freedom to go around, that if someone else starts getting more rights or more freedom, then somehow I must necessarily be losing mine. We all learn this. In the autistic community, it is not uncommon at all that I've encountered people who will say, well, yes, I'm autistic and I should be accepted because autism is not a mental illness or, well, I don't have an intellectual disability of some kind. And really what that statement is saying is my humanity is predicated upon the inhumanity, the lack of personhood of those who actually have a mental illness or an intellectual disability. I've heard this so many times from people in the predominantly physically disabled community as well. They will say, well, yes, I have this disability. I use this wheelchair. I move in this way, but my mind is fine. Everything's working upstairs. You know, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I'm literally right here. Hello, I'm autistic. I have psych disabilities and you're telling me that the reason that you count as a human is because you're not like me. What message does that send? Do you hear yourself? Do you understand the implications of what you are saying? And yet this is something we practice outside and beyond disability as well. It is the legacy of white supremacy in this country that tells me, well, you, Lydia, you are a light-skinned East Asian person, so you can claim personhood, almost personhood at the very least, if you attempt to assimilate yourself to whiteness, to approximate whiteness, to milk whatever proximity to whiteness it is possible for you to try to grab onto, and in the process, throw black, brown, and indigenous people under the bus, then maybe you can count as almost human. It is the process by which we in the queer and trans and asexual communities have said, yes, being queer and trans and asexual is great. It is not a mental illness. There is nothing wrong with us. And while that's technically a true statement and that sure, it's not the same thing as psych disability, what we are implying by that statement is, but there is something wrong with those people over there. The ones who are actually mentally ill, those people, the ones who really belong in that category, they're the ones who are dangerous and unstable and scary and threatening. They're the ones who don't know what's for their own good. They're the ones who need to be controlled and surveilled for the good of themselves, of their families and the rest of society. Don't lump us in with those people over there. This is disavowal, and we are all invested in it. The antidote to the oppression that we face and the oppression that our communities face and the ways in which we have been taught to be deliberate, active participants in it is to practice and embrace what I've called disability justice. Disability justice is a framework. It is principles. It is practice. It is also building blocks it is visioning, it is our future. It is what it is we might begin to imagine is possible so that we may build and sustain it. Disability justice is at its core a recognition that ableism is always connected with other oppression. The image on this screen shows a donut hole in rainbowy colors. It says in the middle, all oppression is connected. And the word privilege, somewhere on the side of this with these words, is spelled wrong, and I will never be able to unsee that. 
You can all see it's on the, the left hand side, about halfway up, the donut. Privilege, it's spelled wrong. I, I did not create this donut, but if I did, I would be even more, I can't stop looking at it, I can't stop looking at it, and eventually would Photoshop it. <laughs> the image shows words about topics on identity and power and privilege. But the purpose of me showing this to you is to reinforce that when we move toward disability justice, we start with the recognition that ableism is necessary for and dependent on every other form of oppression. They cannot succeed without one another. The notion that to be a woman means you are prone to emotionality, irrational, hysteric, or neurotic is ableist logic. The notion that to be negatively racialized, to be a person of color, means that you are less intelligent and capable than a white person is the logic of ableism. The notion, in fact, that to be poor means that you are stupid and irresponsible is the logic of ableism. The notion that people living in countries in the global south, predominantly black and brown and Asian nations, need white people from global north western countries to come and rescue and save and civilize and develop their nations, that too is the logic of ableism on a global scale. And so disability justice says start with this recognition and then we can move toward understanding what it means to recognize our humanity and our worthiness. Because justice tells us that the rights work that so many of us have done, let's pass this legislation, let's improve these laws, let's repeal harmful things like the Section 14C, will be enough. And the reality is, it is insufficient. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed almost three decades ago, and government is still not following it. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was passed nearly half a century ago, and schools continue to routinely violate the rights of their disabled students, particularly their disabled students who are multiply marginalized. Justice tells us that rather than relying on laws to apparently change society, which they will never be able to do, we must instead radically transform the values that we hold and that therefore inform the ways that we form relationships, relate to one another, who it is that we value in a real practical sense, and let that then inform the ways that we build our educational practices what it means to enable space to take accountability for harm done, what it means to ensure that every person has access to safe and accessible housing, what it means to ensure that every person has access to affordable and to multiculturally responsive health care or mental health care, to what it means that if each of us can live in a community or a neighborhood where we feel safe and where we belong and where we have chosen to be. Disability justice means many things, from Talila Lewis, the image here is of a black person looking directly at the camera. Disability justice is honoring the whole humanity of every person. That is to uplift and affirm all aspects of who a person is, their identity, their experiences, their histories, what has brought them to where they are now, and not to omit or deliberately erase portions of that story that are inconvenient or uncomfortable for those of us who are telling it. It is to honor all parts of a person's humanity in the context of disability it is to recognize that our disability not only does not detract from our personhood, but it is in fact a part of our personhood. It is part of what makes us human. From Mia Mingus, the image here is of an East Asian person sitting on a wall of some rocks and cacti. The cacti look very nice, but we should not touch them, which I totally don't know from personal experience. Nope, that never happened. <laughs> Disability justice can be defined in many ways, but the two that I've put here are number one as moving from access to wholeness and number two into find home. What it means to move from access to wholeness is to think on what it means to move from merely making something possible to participate in, can we participate, but thinking what does it mean to be wanted? What does it mean to be valued? What does it mean, not merely that I can get in the door, but that those who are already there want me to be there and wanted me to be there in the first place? How do we create that as an opportunity and an offering for others? <coughs> to find home likewise means to seek that space, literal or otherwise, where we can belong without need for justification or explanation, but simply be, to live authentically, to live freely, to be able to receive love and care from those who are around us. From Mikael Lee, the image here is of a native disabled person in a weird blue tent looking at the camera. 
The definition of disability justice here is to create access culture. What does it mean to embed notions of access into everything that we are doing? What does it mean to rethink access from merely being a checklist as something that we value and practice every day? What does it mean to move the conversation on access out of the context of, well, this is the disability event, to instead being, how am I planning my get together with my friends? How am I thinking about the campaign I'm working on? How am I putting on this art show? Who is it that I am enabling to participate? And who is it that I am desiring to participate? And who has not yet been offered the opportunity to be present? And what can I do to change that? How do I embed access into all that I am doing? From Kaite Davidson, image here is of a black man in a bow tie smiling, defining it simply as active love, a practice of caring for one another. And I want to be clear, this does not mean when he talks about active love, this notion of feel good, mushy, we all get along and like each other, love. What it means is that for those with whom we have chosen to be in community, those we have chosen to enter into our lives, that we can choose to care for one another rather than to choose to isolate ourselves and each other, rather than to choose to treat each other as burdensome, rather than to choose to treat each other as something that has to be done, a project, a checklist, but actually to offer care to each other because to do access, to enable access, to make justice happen, that is an act of love. From Patricia Byrne naming 10 principles of disability justice, we are not talking about all of them. The image here is of a biracial woman in a wheelchair on a stage. She names what 10 principles of disability justice practice are. It starts firstly as an intersectional practice. That is number one on this slide. And intersectionality, drawing from the work of Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, is that naming of what happens when oppressions occur together. It is not merely an additive effect, but it is compounded and amplified when oppressions combine to create particularized experiences of violence that cannot be pared down to merely one word or one name or one identity, but in fact have been co-created because it is not merely that the person is neurodivergent and committed to the psych ward, but that person is one of the 80% of people who are black in that psych ward. It is not merely that this person is one of the students with disabilities who have been forced out of their college campus, but that that person is one of the only three trans students who are going to school at that location. There's a naming of what happens when we exist at the intersection of more than one experience of marginality and also of more than one experience of privilege and resources because that's the reality for almost all of us in this room, that we live at the intersection of multiple modalities and experiences of both privilege and access to resources and those of marginality and oppression. And that's true for me. I'm here as a person who's experienced many forms of marginality, and I also have a lot of privilege and a lot of resources. And that's true for most of us. We move through this world as complex persons, and what is salient or relevant to particular situations and in the ways in which we formed our relations will change depending on where we are and what it is that is happening. And intersectional frameworks enable us to understand that and ultimately to address the harm caused. More importantly, at the end of this list, Patricia Byrne names the value of interdependence. We live in a society that treats us as though the ideal is that we can somehow become this man alone, self-sufficient, on our own, independent from anyone else, free, separate. But the reality is, is that that is not true for a single human being. None of us are independent. We are all interdependent. And not only is that not a bad thing, but it is valuable in and of itself because our interdependence, our networks of mutuality are in fact what make us able to be human and to be in community with one another. These networks of mutuality are what enable us to create collectives to provide care, to provide support, and to organize, and to build power, and to build movements. We do that together, and that is why she concludes her list with the notions of collective access and collective liberation. Disability justice requires us to do the work of access in community. We cannot do it alone or individually. It also allows us and enables us to understand that the work of liberation, that is the work of getting free, to be able to live free of violence and of fear of violence, to be able to live authentically in communities of our own choosing as who we are in all of the complexities and intricacies of our identities, that is collective labor. And from Shane Neumeyer, the image here is of a white person with craniofacial disabilities looking at the camera. Disability justice becomes an imperative for us. What does it mean to make sure we leave nobody 
behind. To make sure we leave nobody behind. And this is not a guilting, blaming, and shaming game, folks. I want you to understand that. This is not a game to say, you need to feel bad. But it is an opportunity. It is an offering for us to think, who is not here and what can I do to either bring them into this space or to bring what I'm doing out to where folks are who've never been able to get into this space. It is an offering. It is possibility. How do we make sure we leave nobody behind. When we talk about disability justice as the antidote, what we understand is that at the end of the day, we only have one another. At the end of the day, if we are seeking that world that I believe we all deserve, where each and every one of us is able to live freely and also to belong, and also to be able to provide and to receive the love and care that we each deserve, requires all of us to get there, and requires us to affirm that not only those around us, but we ourselves are worth it, that we deserve it, that it is for us, and that because we deserve it, it is worth fighting for. I hope to see you in the struggle alongside me. We are already there. Thank you. I know that some of you wanted to stick around because you had questions for me, so you can lob those in my general direction. Uh, also, don't literally throw things at me. That would be mean and also hurt. Yes? So I have a question. I'm really curious what happens is, uh, are there a lot of different countries or different cultures? I'm from Kuwait. I'm there. There are like a lot of people. Are there people like a lot of people of against the learning disabilities and learning disabled people? The world? Yes, but the form of ableism that takes place in other cultural contexts is not always identical. So like what the most prevalent or powerful form of ableism is in one cultural or geographic area, one cultural context or a geographical area, is not going to be identical as somewhere else. So even within the US, what ableism looks like is different from community to community. Yeah. It is different sometimes from disability to disability. I'm from Kuwait. There are right. so many people that are really ableism. Even my mother, she was ableism, but because I have a attention hyperactivity disorder, I had a trouble concentrating in the academics. My mother, she told me I was stupid and lazy. Mm -hmm. She told me you're a, you're a maniac, but she didn't believe me. But then she learned her lesson to have awareness. Right, and in not just in Kuwait, but in other Arab nations, there are also disabled people's movements and disabled people's activism that are taking place too. And that's true globally, that there are always opportunities and places where we as disabled people, whatever that disability might be, are organizing and building with one another because that's where our, that's where our hope lies, is with recognizing each other so that we can support and build and fight to end ableism. But in whatever also, context we're in. But also there's problems with educational yes. problems in Kuwait. They're pretty low educational problems in Kuwait. They don't, uh, the teachers didn't know how to teach with mm -hmm. a lot of disabled students. Mm -hmm. When I've been, uh, I, I went to the, I went to the Sumer School. It's a bilingual school speaking Arabic and English class, mm -hmm. English language. My most Arabic teacher, they're pretty unable to me. Mm -hmm. When I get feeling distracted and the students bully me because I had uh, learning difficulties. Right, and that's awful, and I am really sorry that you had to deal with that. Unfortunately, it's, it is a global problem, mm -hmm. and there are teachers in every nation that hold those same kind of ableist ideas that will tell students that you're stupid or lazy, that won't believe students, and that will enable and allow other students to bully, sometimes violently, other students that are there. Because they were sometimes spending watching those like uh, stereotypical media. Mm -hmm. what, for instance, like Family Guy, they made fun of that alluring disabled mm -hmm. people. Yeah, and that's on way too many shows to mention, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I'm glad you're here. I, I have a question in the front, and then I see a couple other hands. Hi, um, uh, I uh, well, first wanted to say that I've you know been reading a lot of like I've been seeing your blog entries and things for years, and I find that it's really amazing to like hear you and, and you know, hear it, see you speak like you know and you know sort of hear that uh, you know sort of determination and such that always is so present in your blog entries and that, you know, that, you know, sort of 
uh, here, you know, sort of that, uh, you know, how fa how powerful that was. Um, but also, um, like, I'm curious, um, I don't know, like, sp speaking particularly, uh, just jumping off of that point about bullying, I found it interesting, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, the comment about like childhood bullying and bullying in schools reminded me of the blog entry you had wrote semi recently I think that's a year or two ago that was about uh, about like you know sexual teasing and stuff like that in mm -hmm. like high school and pre high school settings you know the fact that even if kids didn't recognize you as autistic and uh, you know. And, and like use that as a try to weaponize that against you. They recognized something, you know, something that was gullible or vulnerable in a way that they could exploit or like. And I related a lot to that. And have you heard a lot from, like, uh, speaking in my case, of course, like you know, I I grew up uh, think you know, I, I grew up thinking you know of myself as uh, white and male. I've since come out as transgender, but the um. Uh, because you know, sort of, I've been able to admit that to myself now that I'm free of those hostile environments. But uh, I'm curious, like, how how often have you heard other people from other people uh, from neuro other neurodiverse people speak to that experience of uh, of like sexuality even before they were old enough to understand or come to grips with it, weaponized against them? Uh, and has it like has it varied like? Have you found that to be more common? Heard that? Heard more of those stories from people who were, you know, depending on their backgrounds. I have heard a number of other neurodivergent people share similar experiences of being pegged automatically by strangers as being particularly vulnerable or gullible, whether that then led to sexual harassment or other forms of harassment. There was a research study published about two years ago about what were called thin slice impressions or what we sometimes call thin slice judgments, what we sometimes call first impressions. And what the researchers did was a series of experiments. They were done in two separate labs across the country in which uh, either images or video clips that were as short as two to five seconds long were shown of various volunteers who agreed to be photographed or videoed, about half of whom were autistic and half of whom were neurotypical. And those video clips or photographs were shown to people who were asked to come look at them and then judge the people, the strangers that were in these images and video clips on measures like likability. Would you want to be this person's friend? Would you be willing to strike up a conversation with this person? Would you be willing to hire this person? As well as things like, do you think this person is intelligent? Do you think that this person is educated? Do you think that this person is highly skilled? Um, what the researchers found was that while not a single one of the people that they questioned were ever primed to be inadvertently biased with words like autism, or disability, they were simply told, just tell us what you think about these people, and then they were asked those questions, that consistently they rated all of the autistic people substantially lower on measures like, would you be willing to be this person's friend? Would you be willing to talk to this person? Do you think they are likable or personable? And that happened even when the people doing the ratings were also autistic. And what that points to for me is a way in which we as neurodivergent people, either autistic or other kinds of neurodivergent, move through the world such that whether or not other people ever explicitly or affirmatively are thinking, ah, that person's autistic or that person's some flavor of neurodivergent, there's a way that we're still somehow pegged in just a split second as, ah, that person is someone that does not conform, that is a deviant person. Or if they are inclined toward cruelty, that is a person who I can target and get away with targeting. And so it doesn't surprise me that I've heard those same stories from many others. Did you have a follow-up to that or a separate well, question? My follow-up was about whether the um, people who were rating the um, people they were showing, whether that was uh, that included neurodivergent people. You answered it did. that for me, yes. So thank, so yes, thank you so much. That's this is it's really uh, helpful and affirming to hear it, and so it helps me to identify uh, some stuff that in the past, I guess. I didn't necessarily think of clearly as ableism because it wasn't from people who understood mm -hmm. that I had a disability so much as people who just found other ways to take advantage of me, you know, based on, you know, somehow recognizing mm -hmm. some difference. So I see several questions. I see four hands, five hands right now. I saw these two hands first. So I'm going to take the person in the cap and then the person in the plaid shirt. And then after them, that's one, two. I'm going to take the people in that row right there, three, four. And then the person here with the braids, 
number five. And then the last question, I think I saw a hand over there, a person in the back who just raised their hand in the blue shirt. So those are, those are gonna be the questions we'll take and then we'll conclude after yours. Okay, uh, this is a really big question, so I feel kind of bad now that I know there's all these people behind me. Um, but, so, you connected um, ableism very, very clearly to capitalism. Do you believe, in your opinion, your very educated opinion, that to get rid of, to dismantle ableism would require dismantling capitalism? Do you believe dismantling capitalism would require dismantling ableism? Yes, to both. Do you believe that they have to be done at the same time, or do you believe that they are the same process? They are the same process. That was a very quick answer. <laughs> I'm surprised that, but I was like, oh God, I'm not opening can No, we're not. I kind of just have a comment I want to share. Like I said, I'm 55 years old, and five years ago I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, ADHD, and a severe learning disability. A psychiatrist tested me for six and a half hours, and he says, you have a 4.6 grade level. And I want to say, I have struggled 25 years to find help for disability. I have found nothing in the state of Vermont they don't even know who to lead you to for help at the Department of Motor Vehicles Department. They says we've never experienced this. On the federal level, I've spent 25 years in pursuit of legal help to battle the biggest corporation in the state of Vermont, Ben and Jerry Corporation. Myself and others were held off the ground and smashed with a board. I sustained re occurrence of my trial childhood trauma it's all documented with the doctors and I had to spend 25 years of myself suffering and I finally filed a lawsuit a month ago in New Fane Court I'm battling a one billion dollar corporation in Vermont and they refuse to apologize and do the right thing so I have found there is no legal help for you they say they don't have the money and I've done this, and they have spent thousands of dollars and in two inches of documentation to have the Vermont judge to throw it out of the court. So I just want to say, I wish you luck, but I have found in 25 years, I have got no justice from the Attorney General. Bernie Sanders is friends with Jerry of Ben and Jerry. I was insulted and re-triggered when they came out with a new ice cream that said, uh, so, uh, what is it, justice uh, remix, and on the back of it, it says not justice for some, but justice for all. We have never received justice for an assault at the workplace with my learning disability, and even the state trooper said it's an unresolved issue, it needs to be answered. I just wanted to share that with you about the Vermont Ice Cream Company. And for many of us, we have not yeah. ever received justice. Most of the things that I've been through in my life, I've never received a measure of justice for. I hope that perhaps that will change. I'm not particularly optimistic, but that is why I do not have faith in our laws or legal institutions to save us, and I never will. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you for listening. Um, actually, that's a perfect segue. Uh, my question was, what's your opinion of accommodation of the disabled in law enforcement? And do you think there's any hope of improving it, speaking of someone who uh, has several learning disabilities? So the question, just to repeat it for those who might not have heard, is what do you think of accommodation of the disabled in law enforcement? And do you think there's any hope of improvement for it, speaking as someone with many learning disabilities? Is that accurate? Yes. I've gotten good at that. Thank you. <laughs> I used to believe that if we trained and educated police that that would fix things. I no longer believe that. I believe that the only solution to police violence, whether that is very subtle violence or whether that is overt violence, is abolition. That's not to say I believe we should have a society in which we all run wild and kill each other, but it is that I believe policing as an institution is not the answer to violence because the police are themselves an incredibly and inherently violent institution. And therefore, why would we trust police to stop violence? I don't believe that there is such a thing as accommodation of disabled people that can be done by police because whenever they attempt to try or claim that they are doing so, they only use that as further grounds to lead to higher likelihood that a disabled person may be imprisoned or that a disabled person may be subjected to some other form of maltreatment or perhaps murdered. And I don't have faith in that. I agree with you. Um, so you briefly touched on it when you were talking about the different modes of thinking about 
disability. Um, but I was wondering about um, just ways of reconciling um, disability, such as a lot of neurodiversity, where it's like we're, you know, we exist, you know, we don't need a cure versus, you know, like I also have depression, and that's something I would like, you know, to not have anymore. I know it's something in the in a lot of when you look at different forms of disability, something that can be um, you hear like contradictory messages depending on like the form mm -hmm. of disability. I was just yeah, I don't, I don't know how to. <laughs> Worded, I think what you're getting at is the what seems often like a conflict yeah. between the notion that some things a lot of us want to go away. Like, I don't know a single person with epilepsy who's like, that seems cool, I'll keep it. Yeah. Um, I have obsessive compulsive disorder with a lot of intrusive thoughts, and I would love to have that removed. If I could press a button and turn it off forever, that would be awesome. And there are also many of us, as you mentioned, who in the cases of many other types of disabilities will say, don't cure us, there's nothing wrong with that, and we don't want it to go away. I don't see there as being a conflict at all. What I see is the problem, as the problem is being an ableist society that denies us the ability to be able to receive care when we want it and need it, and the ability to make actual meaningfully informed decisions about our own lives, whether that is a decision to reject a type of cure, whether it exists or only hypothetically could exist, or whether it is one to seek one, and one that in our present society places a value judgment on, in the assumption that of course all people with all types of disabilities must by default be seeking a cure and that if you're not, then you're not doing the right thing. If we didn't live in a world that had that value judgment attached to it, why should there be any value judgment attached to exercising autonomy over your body to either choose disability, like choosing I wanna make sure that my kids have the same disability as me, or being able to choose I would like to be able to seek a cure for this thing that I don't want that causes me distress. There shouldn't be a value attached to either of those things. But in our ableist society, there is. One is seen as necessary, and the other is seen as evil. And neither of those should be true. What inspired you to get involved in this work? That is a lot. <laughs> as a disabled person, obviously this is very deeply personal to me. But it is also something that affects the lives of many of my friends, my family members, and other people in my communities. And more importantly for me, I have believed from a very young age that every single one of us has a moral obligation to use whatever resources we have access to to fight and stand up to injustice in all of its possible forms. Or, you know, to lie down and punch at it. You know, resources means many different things. It can mean time, knowledge, skills, money, tangible things, intangible things. It can also mean emotional energy. It can mean our spoons. But I believe that whenever we have resources beyond what we need to basically take care of ourselves and those that are directly in our lives that we've offered and agreed to provide care to, that whatever we've got left over, we do have an obligation to make use of, to challenge injustice. And I've always believed that. And so I've always strived to live up to that myself. I don't know that I've always succeeded, but I've tried my damnedest. And that's really what has always driven me to do the work that I do. And I think we had one last question, which is the person who is up there. Hello. Hello. Um, so you've talked a lot about like, or like how there are certain institutions that we have as they are today that you don't have faith in, such as the police and um, well, the legislative system. And so I'm wondering like, what you think, or what you think are some of the best ways to go about, not just like changing our institutions, but changing people's minds. Like, you know, what are, what are the best ways to get people to be open-ended and, and, or open-minded, I mean, um, and accepting of neurodiversity and just understanding of the need for change and, and open to it. Um, sure. Right, so yeah. there are many ways to do that, and I believe that all of them are necessary, whether that is through conversations with people we already know, whether that is through changing practices and policies and places that we have access to, like our club meeting, or our garden house, or the house that we share with five roommates. It is through whatever we are doing, if you're doing it on social media, 
It is through actively building alternatives to systems that are harmful. So instead of relying on the types of shelters that place ridiculous types of rules and regulations on people who are seeking their services that really only serve to harm people while paternalizing them, can we, if we have access to resources, pool together the resources necessary to support our community members who are fleeing violence or fleeing abuse? Can we, in the classrooms that we're in, propose different ways of doing the learning and the teaching that make more sense for the people who are present? And can we change what we're doing in our workplace, whether it's how we're treating customers or what we're doing with clients or what it is that we're doing when we have our meetings for our staff? And you know what that looks like is different for every person and in every context. I don't know that there's one way to do it, but I believe that each of us has something to work with. And that, that is what we need to be working within, at least to start with. And you know, I want to be clear also, I'm not saying I don't think it's worth ever engaging or never engaging with legal institutions or with institutions that currently exist, but rather not to look to them for our salvation, but to look to them for what can we do to change the harm they're doing now, in other words, to practice harm reduction in an advocacy or policy sense, while also simultaneously working to create the things that we want to exist that are not here now. So for example, it was mentioned in my introduction, um, I co-created and I, I lead the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependent Survival and Empowerment. And that fund directly gives out money with no strings attached to autistic people of color globally. But we also are run by two people who are all volunteers. We don't get paid for it. We don't have a lot of time for it, and we don't have money to begin with. So we're funded entirely by donations, the vast majority of which are from our community members who are disproportionately low and no income. So for those of you who are here tonight, if you're looking for something tangible to do, we will accept donations. Shameless self-promotion, had to do it. <laughs> but we will accept those donations, and those donations will go toward us doing what many of our institutions won't. Because most institutions that will provide some money to people will provide it with a lot of strings attached that are intended to accomplish paternalistic aims like uh, micromanaging how someone is using the funds that are given or limiting it only to certain specific purposes. When we recognize that if someone needs money for some reason, that they know what that reason is. And they're the one that is best equipped to decide how to spend it. And as long as they're not spending it to buy the murder weapon for something, then you know it, it, it's fine by us, whatever they're doing with that. And to this day, we've given out over $15,000 to help people flee abuse, pay for mental health care, cover costs for their service animals, travel to visit a college that they're thinking about going to, buy art supplies, go on a vacation for the first time, get their textbooks, be able to cover a gap in rent, turn their lights back on, get their car unrepoed. That's a verb, what is it called that? Unrepoed. Re Wait, like, uh, re-repoed, great. Yeah, you know, doing all sorts of things that might not have otherwise been possible, and we'd like to keep continuing to do that, but that's a, an example of something that people who weren't belonging to an institution or not working from within an institution are trying to do what we believe in and hope that eventually this will spread and it will expand and that we will work toward, hopefully, probably not in my lifetime, if I'm lucky, but I probably won't be, a society where it's no longer necessary to even have that as a functional thing. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. If you're a registered Massachusetts voter, do not leave. I'm temporarily kidnapping you.